Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for coming to today's Senate occasional lecture. I'm Jackie Morrison. I'm the Clerk Assistant Procedure. Before we commence, I'd, and in welcoming you, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land upon which we meet and their elders past and present. The centenary of the First World War Battle of Bathsheba gives us a great opportunity to survey our ties with New Zealand. On the 31st of October 1917, New Zealand Mounted Rifles and Australian Forces captured the strategically important town of Bathsheba as a prelude to the eventual capture of Gaza from Ottoman forces. To reflect on 100 years of Australia-New Zealand relations, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our speaker today, His Excellency Mr Chris Seed. The High Commissioner has been the New Zealand High Commissioner to Australia since November 2013. And prior to this position, he was a Deputy Secretary in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade. He's previously worked for the Ministry of Defence. And his early career included assignments in Tehran, Canberra, London, and Papua New Guinea also as High Commissioner. He's also had a number of roles in Wellington and served with the International Peace Monitoring Team in the Solomon Islands, the New Zealand delegation to the UN General Assembly, and was seconded to the Australian Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. Would you welcome, um, help me to welcome the High Commissioner? Well, uh, thank you, uh, Jackie. Thank you very much for the uh, introduction. Um, and thank you very much for the kind invitation to uh, uh, come and speak in this um, august parliament uh, on this, this day. Um, it's a rather interesting day uh, for New Zealanders, of course. Um, we're waking up to the news of um, Jacinda Ardern's um, elevation uh, to be our Prime Minister, our 40th uh, Prime Minister, our second youngest and um, the third um, female to uh, hold the job. So um, it's, uh, that speaks to the uh, Senate's great timing uh, in extending this invitation. Um, and I thank them for that and I thank uh, all of you for the interest um, in, uh, in things New Zealand. I contemplated uh, beginning this uh, speech with the line, um, friends, politicians, countrymen. Um, but with um, Australian ingenuity uh, being pretty material uh, in this place at the moment, uh, let me in uh, start instead by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land here, the Ngunnawal people, their elders past and present, and indeed all Indigenous Australians, including of course those represented uh, in this parliament. And for um, any Deputy Prime Ministers, um, Senators or other fellow New Zealanders present, um, a warm tēnā koutou uh, to you too. Um, it's been, become habit, I guess, for leaders on both sides of the Tasman to refer in their official remarks to our two countries as family. One may well argue that the recent um, parliamentary dual citizenship re uh, revelations simply take that sentiment to its logical and literal conclusion because a closer analysis shows that trans-Tasman political family tree to be surprisingly deep-rooted. At a rough count, we've furnished each other, voluntarily I might add, with no less than three Prime Ministers, possibly four if John Gorton was indeed born in Wellington, as has sometimes been claimed. And at least two Australian state premiers in recent uh, decades, Joe Biaki peterson and Mike Rann, were born in New Zealand. Remarkably, in fact, nearly every major political party or its predecessor, currently represented on either side of the Tasman, has at one time boasted a leader or deputy leader who allegedly or actually hailed from the other side of the ditch. Notably, though coincidentally, this includes the first Labour Prime Ministers of both countries, Michael Joseph Savage, uh, became New Zealand's Prime Minister in 1935, born in Victoria, and Chris Watson, um, Australia's um, first Labour Prime Minister in 1904. Indeed, uh, in a situation uh, people today might regard as a bit ironic, um, the High Court included, 
Uh, Watson's New Zealand heritage and upbringing was reportedly invoked at the time precisely to support his constitutional eligibility for Australian office. This was on the basis that it made him a subject of the Queen, notwithstanding his birth father's more constitutionally questionable South American and German ancestry. But legal interpretations aside, one of the better personal reactions to the uh, dual citizenship story of the moment would have to have been the Sky News commentator who observed that the relevant section in the Constitution existed to guard against politicians who were the subjects of a foreign power. And he, with I think all due respect to New Zealand, pointed out that we were neither. <laughs> because in many ways it's that kind of sentiment that uh, points to a few clues about how we've arrived at the bond our two countries enjoy today. The Battle of Bathsheba. I should um, return uh, to the thematic starting point uh, for this speech because in just under a fortnight on October the 31st, Australian and New Zealand political and military leaders will meet in Israel to mark the centenary of the, that First World War battle. Just like another watershed moment in our country's history, this one also features a battlefield in a far-flung corner of the Mediterranean. In some ways it will be an unusual commemoration. First, the outcome was somewhat different to that other Mediterranean campaign. Compared to Gallipoli, not to mention some of the other Middle Eastern battles, and certainly in comparison to the scale of our contribution and casualties on the Western Front, Bathsheba itself was a relatively minor action. But to co-opt a cliched phrase often used for both our countries, it certainly punches above its weight in name recognition. Like uh, most such events in our national histories, that's probably because it's a cracking yarn and a genuine piece of Anzac history. For a start, unlike on the Western Front, Bathsheba and indeed the whole Middle East campaign featured a combined New Zealand and Australian fighting unit, the Anzac Mounted Division. Formed in the wake of Gallipoli, this division comprised the New Zealand Mounted Rifles Brigade, the 1st and 2nd Australian Light Horse Brigades, and even, for good luck, the British Royal Horse Artillery Brigade. By the time of Bathsheba in October 1917, the ANZACs, together with the Australian Mounted Division, had defended the Suez Canal in 1916 and played a key role in the critical victories of Romani and at Magdaba in January 1917, which drove the Ottoman forces back across the Sinai. In March and April, it had fought side by side with the Australian Mounted Division against heavily defended Turkish positions in the first and second battles of Gaza. At the time, the Anzac Division was being commanded by Australia's then Major General, uh, Major General Harry Chevelle. But the imp Imperial Forces' failure uh, to take Gaza in those battles saw him promoted in April 1917 and given command of the entire Desert Mounted Column. So in addition to now being commanded by the first ever Australian Corps commander, the Anzac Division's Antipodean credentials were further enhanced when Cheval was succeeded by a New Zealander, Major General Ted Chater. Notably too, Cheval's new command also featured another unique Anzac unit, the Imperial Camel Corps Brigade. Uh, animals the Australians uh, were perhaps more familiar with uh, than, the new, than uh, their New Zealand counterparts. In the wake of the unsuccessful Gaza battles, the new commander of the Egyptian uh, Expeditionary Force, um, Sir Edward Allenby, decided Gaza needed to be enveloped rather than frontally assaulted. So Cheval's desert-mounted column was accordingly dispatched to the eastern end of the Turkish lines and toward the town then known as Bathsheba. The ensuring battle was textbook, uh, was a textbook case of trans-Tasman cooperation. History has predictably focused on the famous late afternoon charge of the Australian light horse. But in fact, a fair dose of the day's action fell to the Auckland and Canterbury mounted rifle regiments who took the strategic and heavily fortified high ground of Talshiva to the northeast of the town, supported by the third Australian Light Horse Brigade. 
At the same time, the 20th Corps, supported by the Anzac Camelliers, uh, had been conducting a separate attack on the town's southwestern defences. Talshiva's capture and the 20th and Camel Corps' attacks paved the way for the famous Australian uh, charge through the middle of the Turkish lines. Uh, from their hard-won position atop Talshiva, the New Zealanders uh, had, a ring, had ringside seats for the charge. Auckland mounted rifleman Frank Twistleton described the charge as the most showy fight I've ever witnessed. The Australians showed plenty of nerve and dash. Great example of New Zealand giving credit where credit's due. The Australian 4th Brigade, by contrast, if they had time to think, might well have thought apprehensively back to another famous cavalry charge 63 years earlier at Balaclava. In this case, though, instead of Russian cannon, it was camels to the left and Kiwis to the right. Not exactly the stuff of Tennyson, but happily for this light brigade, at least no one had blundered. Back on Tal Shiva, Lieutenant Colonel James McCarroll of the Auckland Mounted Rifles, their commanding officer, descri described a great sight suddenly sprung up to our left with lines and lines of horsemen moving. The Turks were on the run and the Oz Division was after them. The Shiva was ours. Fast forwarding 100 years to the centenary commemoration, our representatives will no doubt reflect on that joint Anzac effort. And as the Besheva centenary commemoration is also one of the last major joint commemorations for the First World War centenary, our representatives may also reflect, reflect briefly on the past three years of Anzac centenary commemorations, and particularly the recognition given to the letters NZ and ANZAC. The Australian Government has been scrupulous in acknowledging that throughout the centenary period, and it's an approach we've seen echoed across the Australian community. In practical terms, it's meant the Australian Governor-General attending the 2015 ANZAC Day uh, dawn service in Wellington, which was recipro reciprocated by the New Zealand Governor-General travelling on the same day to Canberra that evening to attend the last post ceremony here at the War Memorial. And I, can I just say as someone who was involved that the logistics of this transfer alone, two Governor Generals on the same day travelling across the Tasman may have done more to unite our bureaucracies in shared horror <laughs> than uh, many other recent joint policy initiatives. <laughs> it was though um, in a good ANZAC tradition done very successfully. It has meant senior political representatives from each country at the other's national services uh, and form units from both the ADF and the NZDF participating in major commemoration, uh, commemorative activities in the other countries and overseas. It's meant a huge uh, array of collaborative projects between our sound and film archives, between our cultural and community groups. Um, it's also um, seen nearly 200 requests to um, um, the New Zealand High Commission uh, from schools and RSLs around Australia seeking New Zealand flags and anthems to include in their own ceremonies. Um, and I, can I just say that you can probably imagine the nervousness in our office um, at the uh, New Zealand flag, uh, or as the New Zealand flag referendum came and, want, came and went, we had large piles of New Zealand flags ready to give away. A change might have, um, we might have had uh, a few spares. Um, but it's been a great illustration, uh, the, co the commemorative period has been a great illustration that the bonds between both countries run much broader and deeper than the formal government to government relationship. Uh, maybe we shouldn't be surprised by this. Australian public sentiment uh, has been clear for a while. In the 10 years that the Lowy Institute has conducted its annual thermometer of Australian attitudes towards other countries, New Zealand has consistently ranked as the country most warmly regarded by Australians. And this year the sentiment maxed out at 85 degrees. So that's hot even by Australian standards. And at the top of a real mountain, um, like our Aki Mount Cook, it's pretty near boiling point. But it's a sentiment which few, if any, um, countries today uh, could claim to match, let alone consistently over more than a century. And in the current international context, where many other long-standing and close relationships appear to be fraying, the resilience of the trans-Tasman bond seems even more impressive. 
but the past hundred years have been quite a journey, so it's worth briefly reflecting on some of the similarities and differences between 1917 and today to understand and to appreciate how far we've come. At face value, much about the Australian and New Zealand of 1917 would seem familiar to us today. Then, as now, Australians and New Zealanders travelled freely and extensively across the Tasman, particularly as t migrants, certainly to work, and even then as tourists. The migratory pattern saw large numbers of New Zealanders and Australians serving in each other's forces. There were more than 2,000 uh, New Zealand-born soldiers uh, in the Australian Imperial Force in the First World War. It's a remarkable figure given New Zealand's population was just one uh, million at the time. And of those 2,000, uh, three, would, uh, three would go on to win Victoria Crosses for Australia. The Trans-Tasman migratory trend is also evidence from the Besheva casualty records. Uh, at least two of the 173 identified Australian casualties buried in the Besheva Cemetery are recorded as having been born in New Zealand. Just as one of the 31 New Zealand soldiers buried there is recorded as having been born in Australia. The, the famous Anzac mateship was genuine then, though even uh, then it was not without its familiar ribbing and rivalry. Uh, notwithstanding their recognised contribution, uh, New Zealanders and the um, Australian Imperial Force were known for some time as Bill Massey's tourists, uh, Massey being our Prime Minister of the time. And Gallipoli may have produced one of history's more memorable trans-Tasman insults. It was uh, from the Wellington Regiment's hard-bitten Lieutenant Colonel William Malone, who once bluntly described his Australian comrades at Quinn's Post as loose, as a loose berry lot with Garibaldian Boy Scout scallywag looks. <laughs> also familiar are the contemporary accounts of sporting rivalry. One official New Zealand record tells of a particularly fast and willing uh, game of rugby played on Lemnos Island between um, teams from the AIF and the New Zealand Expeditionary Force, uh, which the New Zealanders won. Um, the same official record also mentions various cricket matches, but remains oddly silent uh, to the results. <laughs> Notwithstanding the rivalries, in other ways, the 1917 trans-Tasman sporting relationship even seems a bit closer than what we have today. Uh, prior to the war, New Zealand and Australia uh, had sent combined Australasian teams to two Summer Olympics uh, in 1908 and 1912. Um, even more remarkably, well, this is remarkable for Kiwis, uh, a New Zealander won gold in the pool, um, albeit as part of a relay team. Uh, and in 1908, um, uh, the gold for rugby union was competed for and won by the Wallabies. So our leaders may well pause at Bathsheba commemorations to reflect on how the world has changed since then. But no doubt the New Zealand representatives on 31 October will be too diplomatic to mention the date's other trans-Tasman anniversary, the 2015 Rugby World Cup final at Twickenham. Just as I'm sure the Australians won't mention women's sevens, the gold medal you have in that, or compare our respective Olympic rugby medal tallies where Australia uh, leads by a margin. They might though instead reflect on that historic Australasian effort in 1908 and 1912 and note that if a similar joint team had uh, competed at Rio in 2016, it would have won 47 medals including 12 golds, placing Australasia fifth on the overall medal table. So that makes the New Zealanders feel better about themselves anyway. It's not bad for a combined population of 25 million. Sport, military and migration aside, however, in other ways the trans-Tasman relationship of 1917 was surprisingly a lot thinner than it is today. Politically, New Zealand's decision not to federate with Australia, notwithstanding the Constitution's optimistically uh, premature preamble, uh, had long been settled. Uh, undoubtedly, this reflected a range of strategic and policy reasons, but certainly seems to have accurately judged the public mood in New Zealand, at least in so far as this is reflected by a, uh, 19, uh, sorry, an 1899 edition of a short-lived uh, Wellington journal called The Critic which published what it rather loosely described as a poem 
warning against joining the Australian Federation. Um, it's a dith the ditty predicted that doing so would see New Zealand overrun with larrikins, bookies, medical quacks, yes noes, um, sundowners, um, gallow birds and others afflicted with delicate health and chronic fatigue, but active however in all shades of iniquity. <laughs> extraordinary, extraordinary stuff. Whatever the reasons, the decision to go it alone as a dominion and um, Britain's retention of foreign and defence policy responsibilities meant that a big chunk of the bilateral political relationship was transacted after Federation here via London. But perhaps more striking was the relative uh, you know, absence in 1917 of meaningful economic integration. The contemporary investment relationship um, consisted mainly of a few um, New Zealand branches of Australian trading banks, most of which were headquartered in the UK. And our shared emphasis on pastoral agriculture and exporting to Britain meant that New Zealand and Australia both accounted in 1917 for less than 10% of the other's total trade. In the hundred years since 1917, the links between New Zealand and Australia have evolved to cover a broader, deeper and richer landscape. A 2015 study by McKinsey Global Consultancy described us as the two most connected countries on the planet. It ranked us ahead of Canada and the US, Malaysia and Singapore, and even the core EU member states, France and Germany. The story of that evolution and the thickness of the modern relationship reflects a number of strands. The defence relationship provides a material example and perhaps a logical starting point. It's a bond that predates Gallipoli, but in, but in the past 100 years has seen New Zealand and Australian defence forces serving or training alongside one, other, one another in conflict and peacekeeping operations on nearly every continent. It includes our 16 year long commitment in Afghanistan and in a distant echo of a century ago in Beshiva, it is continuing with our joint, uh, sorry, with our Defence Forces joint deployment to the building partner capacity mission in Iraq today. It's reflected in our day-to-day -day defence cooperation. In 2016, more than 2,000 NZDF and ADF personnel travelled across the Tasman on a range of business, from training to study to pre-deployment preparations for Iraq and other theatre. It's roughly a uh, rate of roughly seven a day. And at any given point in time, there are more than 80 uh, New Zealand Defence Force personnel posted in Australia, either on training courses or embedded uh, within the ADF. And of those that are here for training, one in four serve as instructors. Now, those training exercises have come a long way too uh, in their ac accuracy. Um, on the 4th of March 1955, to use a historical example, residents of the New South Wales town of Kurrarong reported their surprise at finding themselves under naval bombardment from none other than the New Zealand cruiser HMNZS Black Prince on a training exercise in nearby Jarvis Bay. Fortunately, no one was killed or injured by the half dozen or so errant shells and the Canberra Times reported a gracious admission of responsibility from the vessel's captain. A subsequent naval inquiry determined the cause as a faulty firing mechanism, but not before the Melbourne Argus, uh, in the best traditions, um, I think we think of Australian journalism, had issued a thunderous editorial laying full blame for the incident with the federal government in Canberra. <laughs> <laughs> but the occasional bombardment aside, the intensive uh, schedule of joint training exercises, personnel exchanges and deployments have continued to reinforce both countries' commitment to our alliance relationship through doctrine inter interoperability and a mateship more or less unchanged from a century ago. In contrast to our defence relationship, in some respects the broader trans-Tasman political relationship has had to play catch-up. At the rarefied um, heights of world statecraft, international connections are sometimes measured by things like the number of treaties and the intensity of diplomatic engagement. But in the Trans-Tasman case, formal diplomatic relations are a surprisingly recent phenomenon. 
New Zealand did not appoint a High Commissioner to Australia until 1943. That's 28 years after Gallipoli, 12 years after the first Bledisloe Cup match, and a decade after the um, suspicious death of our most significant agricultural export to Australia, Far Lap. In other words, the appointment by 1943 was uh, somewhat, uh, perhaps somewhat overdue. And in true uh, trans-Tasman uh, tradition, New the New Zealand government thought long and hard about who was best suited to be their first High Commissioner in Canberra and settled on an Australian. <laughs> Sir Carl August Berenson uh, was born in Sydney in, 19, in 1890 um, and spent the first uh, 12 years of his life in Willara uh, before his family took him to New Zealand. Um, he had a distinguished career there and after serving as head of the New Zealand Prime Minister's Department and effectively founding our Department of External Affairs, he was dispatched as New Zealand's first High Commissioner to Canberra, arriving in March 1943. And his first task was to immediately commence negotiations towards our first significant bilateral treaty, the remarkably broad and prescriptive Canberra Pact, to be signed nine months later on the 1st of January 1944. Uh, he had to do all of this in the midst of setting up in Canberra of the time and with the Second World War happening around him. Impressive though Berenson's career may be, he was um, undoubtedly eclipsed by his Australian counterpart in Wellington, the extravagantly named and larger than life Thomas George DeLaghi Dalton. A boilermaker by trade but boasting skills including juggling, fire eating, amateur theatre and navigating Tasmanian Labour Party politics, Dalton's overseas postings read a bit like a diplomatic uh, cautionary tale. While in Wellington, he reportedly boasted the city's finest wine cellar, admittedly a, a slightly less impressive feat uh, given the realities of 1940s New Zealand. Um, he raised eyebrows after getting into a fist fight at a theatre, uh, and his posting was also memorably curtailed by having to return to Tasmania to answer criminal charges from historic corruption allegations. <laughs> Indeed, such was Dalton's um, diplomatic brand that a subsequent attempt in 1950 to appoint him Tasmania's Agent General in London uh, prompted the outraged Speaker um, to dissolve the House in Tasmania and call a general election. Dalton uh, accordingly remained in Tasmania and spent the twilight of his career using his skills as an impresario to uh, promote his vision of a Miss Tasmania quest uh, to raise money for a children's treatment fund. But the mere 21 days between his commencement of duties in Wellington on 10 December 1943 and the signature of the Canberra Pact on the 1st of January 1944 is undoubtedly a record, one to which many a High Commissioner can only hope to aspire. Uh, today the Trans-Tasman Treaty architecture is a bit more substantial. Uh, New Zealand now has 77 treaties in force with Australia. This is more than we have with any other country apart from the UK. And that comparison is slightly unfair, given many of the British agreements were automatically inherited from the colonial relationship, which effectively give the Brits a couple of hundred years head start. Uh, but in ad addition to those 77 treaties, there are more than 150 non-treaty um, level, uh, non level arrangements that we know of. So Australia is definitely catching up. Formal um, treaties aside, the pinnacle of the political relationship today is the annual uh, Trans-Tasman uh, Leaders Meeting, um, the summit of our two Prime Ministers. Um, interpersonal relations uh, between our political leaders have long been a mainstay of the, um, the Trans-Tasman relationship, uh, helped no doubt by the many family connections um, I've mentioned earlier. Familiarity, of course, can also breed contempt, and the antipathy um, reflected in some of our prime ministerial sledges um, is, of course, the stuff of legend. Uh, sometimes these have been almost lyrical, um, like uh, Sir Robert Menzies' quip in response to a, um, shall we say, pretentious remark by the New Zealand prime minister of the time, Keith Holyoke. Menzies said that from such tiny acorns, great holy oaks grow. Others have uh, been more pointed, like uh, Bob Hawke's description in his memoirs of David Longy as someone who um, seemed to find sustained sessions of concentration difficult. <laughs> 
Uh, Longy, of course, gave as good as he got, uh, remarking that Hawke's book uh, needed to be read by a psychotherapist rather than a politician. <laughs> and of course, Sir Robert Muldoon's famous response to allegations of New Zealand's best and brightest leaving for Australia remains unparalleled, even by re rhetorical masters such as Keating. Uh, compared to this, the, the recent bromance and pyjama diplomacy uh, between Prime Ministers um, Key and Turnbull and the friendship between Prime Ministers uh, Turnbull and English, um, that uh, we live in a world that's quite different. But whatever the reasons for much of our history, such prime ministerial meetings occurred largely on an ad hoc basis. And they were also not without their perils. Uh, in 1906, New Zealand's longest serving Prime Minister, um, Richard Seddon, King Dick Seddon, um, famously died at sea en route back from an official visit to Australia. Um, happily for the High Commissioners today, trans-Tasman crossings are a less risky proposition, though uh, anyone who's flown into Wellington um, may want to dispute that. Um, the modern practice of annualised Prime Ministerial meetings is a surprisingly recent phenomenon being a product of the Howard Clark era. But the sheer number of issues on the agenda demonstrates their necessity as well as the breadth of the modern relationship. During Prime Minister uh, Turnbull's last visit to New Zealand in February uh, this year, for instance, the communique um, included topics ranging from uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership um, to Brexit, uh, the conflict in Syria to cyber security and the threat of terrorism, uh, from the Pacific Islands Forum to people smuggling uh, to the Paris Agreement on Climate Change. The two PMs also witnessed the signing of a Science and Innovation Agreement, which when ratified will take our total number of treaties to 78, and discussed um, ways to further integrate the trans-Tasman economies. Prime Ministerial meetings may be the apex of the political relationship, but the intensity of the official contact, the contact, contact sorry, that underpins them speaks to a much deeper agenda in which both countries are heavily invested. Now, this is illustrated in the sheer volume of ministerial and official traffic between our two countries. In the year to 2017, the High Commission facilitated a total of 89, 89 official visits both ways across the Tasman. This included 36 ministerial level visits as well as the annual meeting of Prime Ministers which took place in Queenstown in February. To put that figure in context, DFAT's um, 2016 annual report puts Australia's total number of high-level overseas visitors at 97. So the 89 trans-Tasman visits I mentioned refers to two-way traffic, but set against the annual suite of Australia's overseas engagements, it's not a bad showing. It also doesn't include many other points of engagement at places like APEC and the EAS summits at the WTO and the World Economic Forum or indeed overseas commemorative events like Anzac Day at Gallipoli or in two weeks' time at Besheva. Nor does it include the numerous and regular ministerial interactions by email, phone, um, or that bane of cautious diplomats the world over, texting. But it does provide a rough metric for the breadth and intensity of the cooperation between our two governments. Some of those visits might even be for meetings of the Council of Australian Governments where New Zealand is represented. On some COAG councils, we have voting rights to reflect those areas where we maintain joint regulatory agencies, such as on food standards. And on occasion, we um, host uh, you know, COAG meetings uh, in New Zealand. Remarkable how frequently in Queenstown. Below the ministerial level, our police forces, customs and border protection agencies, our, our maritime safety, health, environment, science, education and treasury, treasury officials collaborate extensively on issues as diverse as Antarctic conservation, regional economic architecture, whaling, illegal fishing, tax administration, uh, encountering terrorism and transnational crime. Just yesterday, for example, our financial markets, securities and investment regulators announced a further trans-Tasman collaboration initiative in respect of the emerging fintech industries in both countries. We've certainly come a long way since declining to join Federation at the turn of last century. And though that uh, decision has never been revisited and uh, isn't likely to be, all these interactions play a major role in reinforcing, in reinforcing the principles, if not the letter, of cooperative federalism through the exchange of policy ideas across the Tasman.
As I mentioned earlier, it's in the economic sphere where the trans-Tasman relationship has undergone its most significant transformation over the past century. From its low point in the mid-20th century, where Australia lagged many of New Zealand's regional trading partners to account for less than 10% of our trade, it's now unquestionably our largest economic partner. Former Prime Minister John Key often remarked that the five guarantors of New Zealand's success in the 21st century were water that falls on the right places at the right time, the ability to produce protein in a world increasingly demanding it, our English language, the geographic security um, of our location, and the fact that we have a strong, prosperous Australia as our nearest and most integrated neighbour. And in his previous role as Finance Minister, Bill English would often list the four economic met met metrics he focused on more closely than any other in understanding what was going on in the New Zealand economy. Two of them are quite obvious, the milk powder price and the New Zealand dollar exchange rate. But the other two were the Australian housing index and the iron ore price, reflective of the role Australia played, the decisions made here um, that they have on our economy. So on almost any metric, Australia matters to us more than any other international partner. Despite the recent displacement by China as our largest goods market, Australia remains New Zealand's number one trade and investment partner and our largest economic partner by far. Two-way trade totaled $25 billion in 2016. Australia takes nearly 20% of our exports and provides 13% of our imports. And two-way investment across the Tasman exceeds 100, uh, exceeded $150 billion last year. Underpinning all of this is a suite of agreements which collectively are regarded as the world's leading trade and investment framework. Its centrepiece is the Closer Economic Relations Trade Agreement. And although many in New Zealand would love to take the credit, the record shows CER to have been very much an Australian initiative. The idea was first proposed during a series of trans-Tasman political exchanges by the Australian Deputy Prime Minister of the time, Doug Anthony, in 1979. His motivations reflected a mix of the strategic and commercial, on the one hand to bolster the economic security of a key regional partner and also to work better together internationally. But he also wanted to prize open New Zealand's famously closed and protected market, which at that time was also Australia's number one export market for elaborately transformed manufacturers. Surprisingly, given the benefits that have since accrued, the merits of the Australian proposal were not immediately apparent to New Zealand. Though some agencies embraced the idea, contemporary records report significant nervousness from others. One Australian report expressed the author's frustration that New Zealand officials were failing to see what was known as the big picture and, there, and remained infuriatingly fixated on specific tariff lines for whiteware. Another report of the meeting between trans-Tasman agency heads noted that, the, uh, noted that the acrimonious exchange on air services between two, trans -Tasman, uh, sorry, two transport secretaries had to be seen to be believed. New Zealand reports reported similar frustrations that their Australian counterparts seemed unable to acknowledge the country's manufacturing sector or that New Zealand was, to quote, more than just a farm or holiday destination. As the pretenders might say, some things change, some stay the same. Fortunately, the leaders of the time grasped the value of the initiative and managed to cut through the bureaucratic reservations, no mean feat given their own uh, interpersonal differences. Though negotiated by governments of uh, Fraser and Muldoon, CER's signature in 1983 helped catalyse the massive structural economic reforms of the Hawke, Keating and Longy Douglas Labor governments. Successive um, administrations have assiduously built on the CER foundation over the years. Uh, later agreements and um, arrangements have delivered mutual recognition for goods and qualifications, liberalised investment screening, uh, thresholds established uh, joint standards, uh, reg uh, sorry, established joint standard regulators and harmonised our business law regimes. The most recent addition to the economic piece has been the signature earlier this year of a science, research and innovation treaty. This agreement builds on our extensive researcher and institutional collaboration 
and strategic co-investments in major science infrastructure like the Australian Synchrotron in Melbourne and the Square Kilometre Array. It, gives, uh, it aims to give effect to, our, to both Prime Ministers' vision of a trans-Tasman innovation ecosystem. It also forms part of an intensive whole of government and business agenda to deliver a single economic market across the Tasman. The significance of the modern relationship um, is, of course, not limited to the military, to government or even the economy. For most New Zealanders, Australia assumes a far greater importance. Free movement across the Tasman has been a foundation principle of our two countries since the 18th century, and we're coming closer together in population terms. So there are currently around 640,000 New Zealanders uh, New Zealand-born people living in Australia. That's about 12% of uh, New Zealand's population. And around 80,000 Australian-born people in New Zealand. This difference is also a surprisingly recent phenomenon. Not until 1967 did the numbers moving from New Zealand to Australia overtake those going the other way. And although the absolute figures may seem like a big difference, as a percentage of host population, it's actually surprisingly proportionate. It means that New Zealanders in Australia and Australians in New Zealand both constitute roughly 2% of our respective populations. That trans-Tasman population has carried its passions with it. Um, our rugby, soccer, league, basketball, and even American football teams all play in Australian domestic competitions. Uh, we listen to musicians like Crowded House, Gotcha and Kimbra, watch TV shows like Neighbours, Home and Away or Top of the Lake. And we're even united in our mutual attempts to variously claim and then disown Russell Crowe. <laughs> this is also reflected in the vast array of um, professional and cultural Australasian associations spanning the ditch, from uh, chartered accountants to philosophers. Uh, convenience stores to pharmacies. Even our parliamentary staff cooperate outside of work hours through the Australasian Society of Clerks at the Table. Who would have known? Um, as the McKinsey report made clear, our relationship is deeper and broader than nearly any other country, but it's also incredibly intimate. Um, while Australia's significance to New Zealand goes without saying, the question is, what's in it for Australia? Uh, we think quite a lot. Economically, New Zealand is Australia's seventh largest two-way trading partner, and we're Australia's fifth largest market for service exports. But headline statistics of that sort only tell part of the story, especially those based on value during a commodity boom. One often overlooked aspect of New Zealand's trade with Australia is that we are disproportionately important to Australia's small and medium-sized enterprises. More than 18,000 Australian businesses export to Australia, way more than to any other country. The US is next with about 10,000 companies exporting there, just 6,000 export to China. And while China predominantly buys mineral commodities, New Zealand is a particularly important market for higher cost and labour intensive industries like Australian pharmaceuticals, medical devices, engineering and manufacturing goods, as well as IT and especially services. And the growth rates in these export sectors have been even more impressive. We're, we're also still each other's largest source of um, foreign tourists. In uh, 2017, an estimated 128 flights a day, that's 47,000 a year, uh, will carry nearly 7 million individual passengers back and forth across the Tasman. Put simply, this means New Zealand underpins a lot of Australian jobs and a lot of good times. Recent experience uh, has also shown that free movement across the Tasman is not a one-way street. For, since 2012, the traditional dynamic of trans-Tasman migration um, has almost uh, completely reversed. Australian migration to New Zealand is now up 50%. While some people have been tempted to describe this in triumphal terms, the reality simply reflects that the automatic stabilisers of our single economic market are working precisely as they were intended to adjust to shifting economic conditions to the benefit of both of our countries and our economies. Integration is also literally paying dividends for Australian and Australian shareholders. Um, Australian investment in New Zealand tripled between 2000 and 2016, 
meaning we're now the fourth largest destination for Australian investment. New Zealand is also Australia's um, 11th largest source of foreign investment here, with over 45 billion invested by New Zealand in Australia. That's more than from Canada, from Germany and France, or from Korea and India combined. Drilling below the headline stats to the enterprise level, this includes companies like Fonterra, which is now Australia's leading uh, food service and dairy ingredients provider, processing something like 1.7 billion litres of Australian milk a year and employing close to 1,700 Australians. It would also include companies like Meridian and Trustpower, two of Australia's largest investors in renewable and wind energy. Their investments continue a long tradition of New Zealand contributions to greening Australia's energy mix, dating all the way back to New Zealand uh, engineer Bill Hudson, who headed the construction of the Snowy Hydro Scheme. Such investments also extend to the tech sector with companies like Datacom, which was chosen last year by international healthcare provider Bupa as the uh, preferred vendor for 7,000 residents and 8,000 staff across 70 of its aged care facilities in Australia and New Zealand. The deal represented a multi-company collaboration involving two other trans-Tasman companies, MediaMap from Christchurch and SmartWard, a um, Canberra-based business. It also um, opens opportunities for all three um, companies with Bupa and in other international markets. Australian investment in New Zealand is sometimes portrayed politically here as a negative, uh, particularly uh, relative to the smaller sums invested in, in other Asian markets. One answer to this, though, is that, the governments, uh, is that governments don't invest, companies do. And this means investment doesn't always reflect in political imperatives, but rather a clear-eyed commercial decision about risk, stability and the predictability of return all of which attributes easily explain the decision of so many Australian companies to invest across the ditch. But, also, but New Zealand also adds plenty of value um, outside the economic sphere. Um, on the defence side, we're trusted and interoperable security partners with a proven track record of working uh, well together with Australia. Um, our decision to work together in Iraq is the con con continuation of a century of joint security effort. Um, our Royal New Zealand Navy vessels have been used as substitutes and supplements for Australia's own deployments, even on occasion patrolling Australia's uh, southern waters. Uh, the two Defence Forces have worked incredibly closely, um, including this year, in responding to any number of humanitarian and disaster recovery efforts in the Pacific and our near abroad. Um, our frontline agency collaborations also um, extended to Australian police helping out in Christchurch following our worst ever natural disaster. Uh, or New Zealand firefighters battling bushfires in Australia pretty much every year for the past decade. We've also been e each other's first port of call and the first to offer assistance following major disasters and other domestic events. When Australia hosted the G20 in Brisbane, uh, in 2014, more than 200 New Zealand police were deployed to Queensland and sworn in uh, as um, temporary Australian police officers. Um, the in-depth famili familiarity this reflected in terms of law, doctrine and operating procedures and trust shows just how connected our two systems are. The cooperation between New Zealand and Australia is so instinctive that it can be easy to forget that we are talking about two separate countries and not, as even the Const Australian Constitution suggests, another Australian state. We are separate countries, of course, with distinct identities and often different approaches, albeit with enduring values that are fundamentally aligned. To many outsiders, we look, sound uh, and are the same, although a growing acknowledgement of our distinctiveness has enabled us to better complement one another on the world stage. From 2013 to 2016, Australia and New Zealand concluded consecutive terms on the UN Security Council, a scenario that would have been unthinkable a decade ago. As close though as our two countries are, like any family we've had it and continue to have um, our differences. As with most siblings, many of these have mellowed as we have matured, even underarm bowling may be forgotten eventually. But equally, um, neglect, whether real or perceived, can make even the closest relationships brittle. And for all our genuine success, we are not immune uh, from the same global trends that are eroding so many other long-standing relationships. 
whether that's protection of sentiment threatening to roll back firm uh, access to government procurement markets or fiscal pressures being invoked to tighten people's ability to move, live, study and contribute. Um, all of those issues are at play. Many of them, of course, are long-standing and don't lend themselves to easy fixes. But we need to remain focused on them and their very real, immediate and long-term consequences for our increasingly integrated populations. In doing so, we must also remain mindful of how far we've come in the investments that so many successive governments, institutions, businesses, organisations and people have put to creating, growing and maintaining the relationship we enjoy today. Not least because it reminds us what's at stake and the importance of getting it right. Because in an, in an, in an increasingly uncertain global environment, fa family relationships matter more than ever. And as ever, so much of New Zealand and Australia's success in the world is underpinned by getting things right between ourselves and doing things together as we did at Besheva 100 years ago. Thank you. Well, thank you, High Commissioner. It's been an absolutely rollicking gallop, I think, across our historical, economic, defence and sporting ties. Um, I'm inclined to ask you about the idea of just a sporting federation rather than a political one to resolve some difficulties I have each year with my New Zealand cousins um, around Bledisloe Cup time. But I think there probably might be some more weighty questions out there in the audience. Um, there's microphones to the side of the room. So if you have a question, if you want to come across to one of the mics. Or the mic may, might even come down to you. Look at that. <laughs> Well, thank you, uh, High Commissioner, for that talk. It's a, a great coverage, and I hope it gets great news coverage in Australia. It deserves to. Now, to pick up the clerk assistant's words, my question is, is a weighty one. And it arises from the leaflet that they sent out advertising your address to us today. Uh, the first paragraph, I think, was probably uh, put together uh, by you or your office. And one part of that really caught my attention. It's just the last sentence in it. And I made an assumption, and that is that the unnamed uh, New Zealand Prime Minister there was Mr Muldoon. And if that's the case, whether the ending doesn't have a bit of a diplomatic gloss on it. Because it implies that Mr Muldoon, if I'm right there, said that the interrelationship which is so developed as you described has influenced, influenced the IQs of both countries. Now, if I'm right in thinking it was Mr Muldoon, I have a recollection that his term was not quite so diplomatic as that. The inference, <laughs> what he said was that Australia, the Australian IQ has greatly benefited from that association and not so much in the case of New Zealand. So my question is, am I right in assuming about the Prime Minister and how about my recollection of what he said? <laughs> Well, um, well thank, thank you for your thanks. Um, um, uh, you're correct, uh, that does refer to Sir Robert Muldoon. Of course, he famously said that um, New Zealanders um, moving to Australia raised the IQ of both countries. Um, but that was a, a, a comment of very, la very last century. Um, and um, isn't it great that we've moved beyond that, um, sledging each other? It's like the other <laughs> <arm> <laughs> <laughs> have another question here. I'd like to uh, point out that that sentence was not invented by Piggy Muldoon. The sentence was originated by a Don from Oxford University who said that when a uh, person from Oxford University went to Cambridge University, that increased the IQ of both uh, universities. And so I thought I'd give you a bit of history of it. Thanks. I'm, I'm pleased to know that uh, Sir Robert was so widely read. <laughs> Any other bits? Uh, just. Uh, thank you for our talk about the, the, the joint togetherness, the brother, brother side of, of New Zealand and Australia. Um, I did find it ironic, however, that the last time we visited New Zealand, Australians had to pay to visit the war memorial 
the very seat of so much of our collaboration and so much of our anxiety. And I was wondering that perhaps a cross-Tasman um, um, meeting may in fact fix that? Can I take that under advisement? <laughs> <laughs> It, it, sound, it sounds like a, a marvellous idea. Um, um, I, I must, must admit I didn't, uh, wasn't aware that people had to pay to go to our War Memorial, but I'm sure that in the New Zealand way we charge everyone. <laughs> <laughs> New, New Zealand included. <laughs> I thought you meant not just the Australians. But the <laughs> I'm sure we wouldn't single Australia so out. Uh, Right, well, if we haven't got any further questions, I might ask you to join me in thank you very much. It really was a very entertaining. Thank you.